Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. In the past few episodes, we've done sort of reviews of quite big topics within the Cultural Revolution, including talking about the military, education, the economy, and society in general. Now, it is called the Cultural Revolution, so it would be remiss of me to not cover how exactly culture was impacted during this period, and what continuities and changes took place within the cultural sphere. Again, like pretty much everything else, culture was affected by this divide that we've been talking about. So the pre-1969 phase of the Cultural Revolution, and then the 1969 to 1976 period of the Cultural Revolution. The specific areas that I'm going to try and cover in this episode, as best as I can, are literature, performance art, like ballet and opera, film and visual art. As we've discussed in previous episodes on art and literature, cultural production in China during the early years of the People's Republic was closely and very consistently tied to politics. Ever since Mao's famous talk at the Yan'an Forum in 1942, the party had been working tirelessly to figure out ways to bring art down to the masses, learn what the masses liked and didn't like, and to transform art from a bourgeois pursuit into a meaningful, ideologically charged vehicle for transmitting communist narratives. In a sense, this episode will kind of be a continuation of those episodes that we've done before on literati, literature and art, and there will be some familiar names that come up. I don't expect you to remember all of them, so I will try and remind you of who they are and what they did from time to time. The idea of bringing art to the masses was also why I wanted to save talking about culture till the end of the Cultural Revolution. So unlike the other areas of society, like politics, education and economics that we discussed, culture was less affected by the rural-urban split that so often permeates all the topics to do with China during this period, but somehow it was more emblematic of the split. Since the late 19th and early 20th century, Major developments in art, literature, film, and traditional performance in China have been concentrated in the more developed coastal regions of the country. Some areas are even known for their specific contributions to developments in culture, like Hangzhou and Beijing. This is because these areas tend to house the major universities and other big sort of institutions and art collectives, and so they're naturally where artists flock. Also, if you remember from earlier episodes, By 1949, most of the country, around 80%, were still illiterate and living in very poor conditions. Art and literature were pursuits that really only those from educated, scholarly, middle-class backgrounds could afford to take up. Even those artists who were from poorer backgrounds did have some form of education, so they were in the minority, generally speaking. There were some attempts during the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution to popularise certain aspects of culture, particularly art production and the creation of propaganda, which we will get to talk about. But we're going to be focusing on major developments in today's episode, which also means focusing on the sort of macro political developments and major urban conurbations. So we're not going to get too granular. I'm just kind of give you kind of an overview of what happened during this period in the cultural sphere. So let's start with stage performance. When I say stage performance, I'm talking about things like plays, opera and ballet. And I want to start here because I feel like this is where the Cultural Revolution was sort of launched, so to speak, and where the major players really concentrated their energies, especially when it came to promoting the cultural narratives of the Cultural Revolution across the country. So if you think back to the beginning of this series, you remember that the Cultural Revolution was launched based on criticism of the play Hai Rui Dismissed from Office, a play that was labelled as a veiled attack on Mao in a scathing review written by Yao Wenyuan, who is one of the Gang of Four. In reality, certain sectors of the literary elite, who would probably have fallen into what we'd consider the radical camp during the Cultural Revolution, had actually already been wanting to make some fundamental changes to the kind of productions that had been put on since the early 1950s. So there was kind of a divide going on. Those who favoured traditional style plays on historical themes included people like the former head of the propaganda department, Lu Dingyi, and mayor of Beijing, Peng Zhen, who compared Jiang's idea for model works to plain boiled water. 
both of these men were purged at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. And then on the other hand, you had those who advocated for change, like Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, who didn't really want to radical a change at first, stating in 1964, for example, that, quote, we should take up historical operas only on the condition that the carrying out of the main task, that of portraying contemporary life and creating images of workers, peasants and soldiers, is not impeded, except for those about ghosts and those extolling capitulation and betrayal, good traditional operas can all be staged. Most opera companies resisted this modernization effort until Jiang Qing was able to push changes through after the launch of the Cultural Revolution. What was really at stake wasn't the representation of questionable characters like ghosts, but rather the representation of Chinese traditions and myths. For those of you who aren't too familiar with the form, Peking opera is a type of Chinese play that dramatizes traditional Chinese stories through the use of singing, pantomime, and even acrobatics. It's a lot more heightened than Western opera. The characters are often dressed in outlandish costumes and wear lots of exaggerated makeup and even masks that are supposed to represent their characters like warriors and demons. Most of the famous operas depict Chinese myths and legends, and are divided basically into either love stories or military adventure stories. Some of them you'll be familiar with, like Romance of the Three Kingdoms or Journey to the West. Others can be compared to sort of Greek or Shakespearean style tragic plays, like Assassinating the Tiger General, which is about the concubine of an emperor who is now seeking revenge for his death, by seducing a general and then killing the general after getting him drunk and then committing suicide herself. Yeah, they tend to be that dramatic. So for the purposes of this podcast, I'll be using opera, play and drama as sort of a catch-all phrase for this sort of staged performance. There wasn't really much distinction between them at the time anyway, so it doesn't really matter just for this sort of general overview. So Jiang Qing wanted to transform the roughly 3,000 existing theatre companies in China so that they were staging modern dramas instead of the traditional operas. Some works from the Great Leap Forward era and after were adapted to include contemporary themes. Well, five themes to be exact. So all of them were themes on war and none of them referred to the original material. It was almost as if that if that material were acknowledged, that any sort of framework before rampant Maoism took place in the 1960s would also have to be acknowledged, so they were just not allowed. These model works were added to a group that were all titled model works together. In Chinese, they're called Yang Banshi, and they were broadcast all over the country. They were played on the radio, made into movies, reproduced on posters, and staged by smaller theatre troops that travelled around the country. And they were often reworked for the local opera tradition of whatever region they were performed in, which also included translating the dialect into the local dialect. These plays came complete with production guides to make sure that every single staging of the play or every radio broadcast of it was exactly the same. By the end of the Cultural Revolution, there were 18 model works in total, including 10 operas, four ballets, two symphonies and two piano pieces, all of which were mainly focused on the themes of World War II, the Civil War, the Korean War, and class struggle. Only eight of those model works are still sort of relevant and famous to this day, though. You'll usually hear people say that there are eight model works by Jiang Qing. So these works also emphasise the importance of the PLA and, of course, Mao Zedong, the two major powers in the Cultural Revolution at the time, especially up until Lin Biao's death in 1971. The heroes in the stories were all based on model workers and soldiers, optimistic sort of ubermensch who were purely devoted to communism and Mao Zedong. But even though they contained Maoist ethics, they still were represented in a traditional Chinese style, with all the glitz and the glamour and the singing and the dancing that you would have seen in the operas in previous years. So if we take an example of one of the model works, which is Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy, this work was adapted from a 1957 book that was then adapted twice more in print in 1967 and 1969, and then adapted into a film in 1960 and 1970. So the simplified model work that's set on the stage is set in 1946, and it depicts a group of PLA soldiers fighting against a group of KMT bandits in Manchuria. 
So the Guomingdang bandits kill and kidnap some villagers, and one PLA soldier, Yang Zirong, leads a group to ambush the bandits in their lair. Yang is our model soldier in this narrative, and in the stage play, the more vulgar aspects of his character that appear in the book are erased to make him sort of more upstanding. For example, there's a scene where he's attacked by a tiger, but in the stage play, he's no longer afraid when he sees it. He also no longer flirts or sings dirty songs, and his proletarian background is mentioned more prominently. Other characters are also pushed into the background so that his character shines out more. His platoon leader, who is a main character in the book, for example, is reduced to merely a soldier, and the villain's grand hall is reduced to just a cave. And the villain was also supposed to have like a whole song in the story as well. I guess it would be something like Be Prepared in The Lion King, but his whole song is reduced to just three lines. But despite all of these changes, many traditional elements of the original work still remained. So the positive characters, who traditionally would have worn red makeup in a traditional Peking opera, still appear with some red symbols, like a red hair tie or a red armband, and they also wear blue or green clothing to signify their rank. There are some sort of traditional, stereotypical characters as well. So you've got the young, courageous hero and the older rascal. You've got like the sort of hunched and menacing villain. There's even different types of laughter that still feature. A friendly laugh versus an evil cackle. And the most reminiscent thing of the traditional style was the use of certain types of music, such as Chinese percussion instruments to punctuate certain reactions, falsetto arias for thoughtful moments, and more fast-paced numbers for the tense moments. There were some modifications made, but these usually incorporated Western instruments or musical styles adapted from Soviet romantic influences, which must have been a real sight to see if you were also watching Chinese acrobatics at the same time, wondering how jarring that would have been visually. The combination of all of these elements was actually meant to serve a political purpose, one that was aimed specifically at the masses. Traditional Chinese elements were retained because they were already broadly popular, and it would have been helpful to convey certain messages that would have been familiar to the masses, but were adapted slightly under communism. The use of Western elements was also supposed to popularise the works for people who were now familiar with Western culture, like people who had started watching movies and who lived in urban centres, and somehow this blending of all these very different styles was actually pulled off. One of the obvious benefits of stage performance for propaganda purposes is that stage performance does not require any physical resources like print or screen, like electricity, but it does rely on manpower, which of course was readily available at the time. It meant that any model opera that was produced was easily replicable at every single level of society, and they could be put on relatively quickly and very cheaply. As one author puts it, quote, They deny the idea of the instability of the text. They prescribe to their interpretive community in every detail one and only one interpretation. This semantic overdetermination, further aided by the fact that model works were ever present in local performances and daily radio emissions as films, posters, short stories, comic books, records, picture collections, piano adaptations, and cut-out figures, becomes blatantly evident in the how-to guides to the performances of the model works, which prescribe exactly how much wattage the lighting must have, how to apply the makeup for actors, where they have to stand, and how they have to move. Interestingly, many of the songs from these plays are actually still popular to this day, mainly because it's all that the much older generation in China who lived through that period were exposed to. Now, obviously, they're all devoid of political meaning, and they have no ideological relevance to the 21st century. Instead, they're just sort of like a nostalgia piece for people who remember living through that time. Just as there were these sort of how-to guides on how to make a revolutionary opera, similar guides existed for how to make a good propaganda art. Propaganda art was actually one of the main themes of my PhD dissertation. I actually discussed the period just before the Cultural Revolution in my dissertation, but I did cover how artists who were working in private commercial companies or 
as just exhibition artists before the communist takeover, were suddenly transformed into cultural workers for the state after 1949. Many of them had supported the communists in the 1940s and the 1930s, but a lot of them were politically agnostic and they sort of just floated about in the first years of the revolution and kind of kept their heads down as best they could. When it came to making new art for the masses, they all had to receive political training, they all had to participate in physical labour, and they all had to read art manuals with very detailed depictions of the clothes, tools and belongings of ordinary people, as many of these artists, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, had middle class backgrounds, they didn't really know about how ordinary people lived and worked. Also, because of the changing preferences for art style during the period, many of them had to start painting in a realist style. The socialist realist style came into fashion in the mid to late 1950s. And many of these artists who'd been trained either in sort of Western expressionist styles or in traditional Chinese styles struggled with depicting people and objects in a lot of detail and very realistically. I also imagine as well that it must have been relatively boring for some of them because painting a photorealistic tractor only to be told that the theme of the painting isn't really revolutionary enough and so you have to repaint the whole thing just sounds really exhausting. So I imagine for a lot of them this was a generally very unstimulating period which only got worse during the Cultural Revolution. Like most people in the bourgeois cultural world at the start of the Cultural Revolution, Many of these artists were severely attacked, often at the hands of their own students. Many art studios were closed down, art journals and magazines stopped publication, and the art bureaucracy in general collapsed. Like many young people, artists kind of considered the Cultural Revolution a sort of 10 lost years period, not only because they felt that they didn't produce anything of worth, but also because many of them had to destroy their existing works. However, the Cultural Revolution opened up the art world to a wider audience, which I guess technically is a good thing. There was a great call for proletariat artists, artists who came from worker, peasant and soldier backgrounds across the country, and as it turned out some of these artists were actually quite talented. They also benefited from the books and guides that were produced and disseminated at every level in society, and so ordinary people were able to get better at depicting, say, the intricate details of a mechanical plough, or just even the way people stood or moved, or wore their clothes. However, regardless of your background, everyone was constrained by the very prescriptive style of art that had a stranglehold on all cultural production during this period. So the narrow range of topics is the same pretty much throughout every single art form. So for for art, as in painting, drawing art, you could have revolutionary heroes, sent down youth, Mao, soldiers, rural peasants and urban workers as your topics. All of the posters or oil paintings, whatever art that was produced, showed some form of success or victory, and they showed the main hero in the centre of the frame, bathed in a pool of light. Propaganda styles of art became more popular than typical expressive art, as propaganda art was seen as the best vehicle for communicating with the masses, and also involving them in mass cultural production. So in this case, literally having peasants paint their own propaganda posters, paint wall murals in their villages, and paint or draw things for magazines that would be sent around the local county. Most of the art that depicted the masses was kind of cut and paste, again, because of these guidebooks that they had been given. So a lot of people sort of followed them to the letter. And so you have just masses and masses of these pictures or paintings depicting people enjoying life in the commune, enjoying a successful harvest, working hard in a factory. And there's sort of this blend in gender as well, where you can't really tell the difference between men and women except for the hair length, because they all have these sort of big red cheeks, big hands and feet, and just completely genderless up and down bodies. One of the most important art forms was probably oil paintings. And one of the most important themes within oil paintings would be paintings of Chairman Mao. So one example would be the famous Chairman Mao Goes to Anyuan by an artist called Liu Chunhua. So this oil painting depicts a young Mao wearing plain clothes and holding a book, staring into the middle distance with a mountain range behind him and also below him in the background. 
It's a very simple painting. You've got the young figure of Mao sort of looking very slim and proud and striking a bold pose. And there's a mix of the traditional elements with new realist elements. So for example, even though the painting is realist in style, Mao is actually wearing traditional Chinese clothes. And the painter has used a landscape in the background as opposed to a more modern setting like a factory or a commune. The colours that he uses are also cool tones like blues and greens instead of the typical reds and blacks that you see a lot during this period. But it's worth bearing in mind that the painting is set in 1922, which makes the choices make a bit more sense. Mao probably would have been wearing traditional Chinese clothes at this point. And apparently the choice of the mountain range was to show that Mao was able to overcome any obstacle and so was worthy of leading the nation. This theme of Mao was very typical, although the way that the paintings were made often wasn't. Most of the paintings showed Mao as what one also described as red, smooth and luminescent and usually avoided cool tones. There was a real emphasis on the fact that you shouldn't be able to see the brush strokes. The sort of rough and ready style was more typical of traditional Chinese painting. And so the entire picture should be really smooth and the picture should be illuminated in such a way that it shows Mao as being the source of light. So kind of radiating a light from within. This is probably because at the time as well, there was a link between Mao and the sun. So there was a saying that Mao is the sun in our hearts. So any references to the sun in either poetry, literature, in art, in anything really at this period of time was also seen to be a representation of Mao as well. Getting the theme right was considered probably a bit more important than how the art looked, but how it looked was also important. So when it came to hiring many of these peasant and worker amateur painters, a lot of the stuff that they sent in was kind of poorly executed, but then it was often corrected or even just completely repainted by an art school graduate to make it acceptable to the urban audiences with much higher standards. The urban students were never really credited with the work, so it still managed to make the masses look good and make them look like they were contributing to sort of the new stage of culture within China. If I remember, I'll try and include some artworks on the website so you can see some examples. But if I do forget, you can always go to ChinesePosters.net and see a collection of different propaganda posters from the period, which are usually based on oil paintings or different styles of paintings and drawings that depict pretty much the same thing from the period. So moving on to literature, this was another area that was a sore spot for the advocates of the Cultural Revolution. So as we discussed in the first episode, for many years after the Great Leap Forward, writers were becoming more and more emboldened to criticise the regime, even going as far as to critique Mao himself. So the, cr- the criticism of the play, Hai Rui Dismissed from Office, was extended to a criticism of the play's author, Wuhan and his other works, including his historical works and critical essays. So here you can see that the sort of cultural sphere bleeds into everything. So one criticism of someone's play would naturally lead to a criticism of their entire oeuvre, whatever that included. Wuhan, for example, was a Ming historian by trade. And during the early phases of the Cultural Revolution, Anything that was positive about the imperial period was attacked for obvious reasons, because that represented traditional China. Wu Han had also participated in the writing of a series of articles entitled Notes from a Three Family Village between 1961 and 1964, along with two other intellectuals, one of whom was Deng Tuo, the former editor in chief of the People's Daily, turned serial critic of the regime, and editor of the paper Frontline. So these guys were all attacked as sort of a group of people who were attacking Mao. And you could say that the attacks were a bit more political than they were based on their actual writing. To an extent, they were sort of used as scapegoats or rather a jumping off point from which to attack the higher ranked officials, such as the mayor of Beijing, Peng Zhen, who was Wu Han's direct superior, or propaganda director Zhou Yang, who was supposed to be overseeing propaganda in all areas, including newspapers like Frontline. This would then extend up to their superiors, people like Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi, who were supposed to be overseeing the running of the country in general. 
The idea that subject matter could be about something other than class struggle, or that literature was an inherently free and artistic pursuit, were quashed in favour of a materialist theory of literature. This new view of creativity was formulated during a forum on art and literature in the armed forces during 1966, which had been organised by Lin Biao and Jiang Qing, and eventually became known as the Shanghai Forum. The literature and art of the last 20 years was attacked as not sufficiently representing socialist realism and paying too much attention to characters in the middle as opposed to the proletariat. They rejected any foreign literature, even Russian and Soviet writers, and set out a strict list of topics that should be covered in the future. Like the operas and ballets that we just discussed, the main themes were to be model workers, peasants and soldiers performing heroic deeds, or one of the wars that had taken place during the CCP's inception. The heroes were to be morally pure and optimistic, never straying from the party line, and the villains should be class enemies, someone out to deliberately oppress and exploit the masses. As one historian put it, quote, the narrator and the main characters in the novels are extroverts and have access to assumedly objective world. There is no time and no reason for much introspection and doubt, as Marxism is believed to be capable of providing the correct guidance to the correct goals. If the motivations of the characters can have no basis in their psychological condition, the novelist must rely on motivation by social and economic determinants, in short, by class conflict. Indeed, all the stories of the period 1966 to 1976 were stories of conflict, and all conflict, according to Mao Zedong, boiled down to class conflict. The best way to describe the literature that was produced during this period is probably just boring. The open class conflict trope got old pretty quick, and authors were unable to portray any sort of hidden class conflict. For example, maybe someone was pretending up front to be a nice person, but then it turned out that they were actually trying to oppress people through sneaky means. This is because there was a chance that the class enemy in question could be misinterpreted as actually being good or have just have misunderstood the situation or something like that. Basically, they didn't want to leave any room for interpretation. The bad people had to be very obviously bad people. Because of this rigid prescription of themes and characters, plots of these books became very, very predictable. People were unsure what would and wouldn't be okay under the new rules, and so there was probably even more self-censorship than there was actual censorship as well. This is all on top of the fact that there was a factional struggle going on within the literary bureaucracy itself, as there was with every single government and party body during this period, and so there was probably very little guidance for writers to go off of anyway. Works released before 1966 also suffered from having multiple revisions to avoid censorship and persecution. A good example is the novel The Story of Ouyang Hai, which is written by Qin Qingmai, and told the tale of a military hero who suddenly died in an accident in 1963. In the original version, Qin described the positive influence of Liu Shaoqi's How to Be a Good Communist on the protagonist. But obviously, after the launch of the Cultural Revolution, that passage had to be changed and it was replaced with a reference to the works of Chairman Mao and praise of Lin Biao. Now, when Lin died in disgrace in 1971, the book once again fell behind the political times, but by the time the new edition was published in 1979, it appeared too early to include a reference to Liu Shaoqi's re rehabilitation. Authors were so scared of deviating from the new line that had been created, and so they restricted themselves as much as possible to avoid being purged, sent down to the countryside, or worse. Deng Tuo, who I mentioned just a little bit earlier, either died or committed suicide. Zhou Yang was imprisoned, and famous authors like Lao She, who we discussed many episodes ago, committed suicide. Zhou Yang had been one of Mao's fiercest supporters, and we discussed in one of the episodes in the mid-1950s literary purges about how he had kind of pushed other people aside. People like Hu Feng and Ding Ling, in order to reach the pinnacle of the literary world, imposing his own standards and traditions on everyone else. However, by the Cultural Revolution, the tables had turned completely. In 1970, an article entitled To Trumpet Bourgeois Literature and Art is to Restore Capitalism was written specifically targeting Zhou as an enemy of Lu Xun, and one of the four villains who masterminded a, quote, sinister counter-revolutionary revisionist line in literature and art 
which opposed Chairman Mao's proletarian revolutionary line. For his sins, he was tortured and humiliated at mass meetings until his eventual rehabilitation and relatively short career after the Cultural Revolution was over. After the death of Lin Biao in 1971, there was a slight shift in that there was a little bit more direction for writers. An editorial in the People's Daily on the 16th of December 1971 called for continuity in Chinese literature, for heroes and stories to be proletariat, and for stories to take cues from model plays. Despite the Marxist restrictions, at least now creatives were encouraged to actually write new works, which they weren't really doing beforehand because, again, they were afraid of getting it wrong. Poets began writing poetry again, releasing volumes that actually did include pre-cultural revolution works. Reprints of popular fiction novels were released, and authors were freed from the accusation that the writer and the narrator were the same person, which then allowed them to write more freely, although in general they just kind of avoided the topic of class struggle and instead just focused on the lives of the proletariat under socialism because that was a lot safer. But there wasn't really a lot in the way of novels produced in this period at all, as there was too much room for negative interpretation. Instead, visual forms became much more popular, like the operas that we discussed, and often their adaptations into film. Now, speaking of film, cinema had been around in China since the Republican era, and had even been used by the KMT for propaganda, but more often than not, it was just to show foreign films to urban audiences in major cities. Of course, access to foreign media was prohibited after 1949, and film viewership became somewhat restricted. The nature of cinema was also a limiting factor in its popularity, however, as one author puts it, quote, Given the necessity for relatively large amounts of capital and high levels of technical specialization in film, it was not surprising that geographically, film was centered on Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Beijing. Socially, the people who made films were also a distinct group of westernized intelligentsia, somewhat isolated from the rest of Chinese society. As in many other countries, perhaps three out of every four feature films shown on screens before 1949 were foreign made. So although film was a very foreign medium and all things foreign were abhorrent during the Cultural Revolution, the party and the Cultural Revolutionary group couldn't really overlook the fact that film had a lot of potential to reach more people than any other cultural medium. Film had been growing in popularity before the Cultural Revolution had even started, and in the 1960s it was actually liberalising under the policies of the reformist group led by Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi. However, during the Cultural Revolution, existing films were often censured for promoting bourgeois lifestyles and ideology, and the community was rocked by political study sessions, labour reform, and imprisonment due to suspicion that they were colluding with foreigners. So not too dissimilar from what was happening to artists. Because of this, film production basically stopped between 1966 and 1969, except for a few documentaries. And the only pre-1966 films that were shown were usually just ones that were examples of what not to do. From 1970 onwards is when films became possessed by the spirit of revolutionary plays, operas and ballet. As with the operas, Jiang Qing and her clique completely took over and set out to purge all of their perceived enemies within the film world. However, it's worth noting that this time it was probably a bit more personal, as in a former life, Jiang Qing had actually been a sort of B-list actress in the 1930s. At the time, she had felt that certain people had stopped her from ever reaching her full potential, especially as she was scandalised early in her career by rumours of an affair with the director. She then went on to join the Communist Party, but because she was so much younger than Mao, and because Mao was married at the time when he started seeing her, the other party members made him promise that she wouldn't get involved in politics for at least 20 years. So the Cultural Revolution was sort of the moment that she'd been biding her time for and the time to kind of take out her personal vendettas on, well, pretty much everyone she knew. But despite her sort of villain origin story, Jiang Qing wasn't actually able to get rid of the majority of people who worked in film, mainly because of the technical nature of the film industry. What she was able to replace, however, was the three most negative elements of film, naturalism, formalism, and fragmented shots, 
with the so-called three prominences that permeated all cultural forms. So the work's positive characters, heroes, and a single main hero. One successful example of the film adaptation of a Peking opera was the adaptation of Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy, which we discussed a little bit earlier. The transition from stage to film was apparently a success across the board. According to one author, more people saw revolutionary operas through film rather than performed live, which is quite impressive. And film also lent itself to the fact that you could go and watch the same thing over and over again. And as there were only about 10 films, then you would end up seeing the same narrative multiple times. Some new fiction films were made towards the mid-1970s, but again, like the other art forms, their contents were heavily restricted, with most focusing on class struggle, or struggle against the elements, or struggle against an external enemy. There was a lot of struggle going on. There was some attempt to find a sort of national style, like with the artists that we discussed, but because of the continuity in personnel and their apparently very strong opinions about film production, most fundamental changes to the way films were made and presented were resisted. This resistance paid off, of course, when The Gang of Four was eventually brought down in 1976. However, film production continued to suffer in other ways. The shutting down of most schools and academies and the attack on bourgeois art forms during the Cultural Revolution meant that many had to delay their careers and in the late 70s and early 80s, the ingenues in the film industry had to compete with the older generations who were just getting back into the scene after a 10-year break. Films also took a relatively long time to complete. In the case of China, I think in one of the places it said the average was around two years. Often the new movies were behind the times, repeating Thai tropes that had been popular in the early 70s, but were by the end of the 70s seen as really boring and repetitive. Film studios wouldn't really find their feet again until the 80s, when the younger filmmakers were able to make works that appealed to younger audiences that reflected their experiences of hardship, love, friendship and loss during the Cultural Revolution. So those were the main art forms that were affected by the Cultural Revolution. A lot of the articles that I've read that were written about culture question whether or not the period was one of stagnation or whether what was produced was really worthy of being called art. As we've seen in this episode, there was a lot of production going on. So saying that art in itself stagnated is probably not the correct term. There was this break from tradition and attempts to form new modes and models and styles, which contradicts the argument that there was say, no music or no literature or no whatever. These things did exist. Whether or not the culture from the decade can be considered true art is another question entirely and probably comes down more to personal discretion. A lot of Chinese historians and a lot of actual artists from the period really sort of look down on that period. I read one story about an artist who was kind of proud of what he had created but he kept it rolled up and tucked underneath his bed and never spoke about it with his colleagues. So it kind of goes to show that even people who did create things and were proud of the things that they created weren't necessarily openly proud about it. And I also read another story that said when the author went on a tour of an art school, they did see a lot of artworks produced during the Cultural Revolution, but they were actually just being sort of stretched out so people could reuse the frames and the canvas for something new. So these works exist, but they're not exactly respected or seen as something valuable and precious to be carried forward into the future. Luckily for us as well, there are a lot of historians who have an opinion about this, shockingly enough. The main problem is seen as being central policy dictating what was acceptable and what wasn't, meaning that most, if not all, art forms were heavily restricted in style and content like we discussed. So here's what one author has to say about music during the period. Quote, music, just like all other artistic production, was subject to extreme political regimentation that only certain correct colours, forms, sounds, too, were officially acceptable. Beethoven, Schubert and Brahms were condemned due to their bourgeois background. Schoenberg and Debussy were considered formalists. Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff were said to be pre-representatives of the revisionist Soviet regime and thus could not be performed. Sounds of the Chinese zither, Guqin, 
were unacceptable as they were associated with the aristocratic literati of feudal China and traditional Chinese operas were said to bring too many emperors and ladies and too few workers, peasants and soldiers onto the stage. This list can be continued almost endlessly. But it should also be borne in mind that it was actually the aim of the Cultural Revolution to overhaul culture. The clue is in the name. As the same article I just quoted from points out, cultural revolution art was meant to be a monoculture. Cultural politics during the Cultural Revolution was a gigantic and in many ways destructive attempt to establish one and only one acceptable artistic taste for all and everyone. If you think about the last episode where we talked about education, and also the first few episodes on the Cultural Revolution in general, we talked about how the whole point of the movement was to flatten society, creating not so much an equal society, but a very specifically prescribed society. This, of course, would mean that people were a lot easier to control by the party as well. Again, one of the points of the revolution. I think it's also worth pointing out that a lot of cultural production from this period was heavily denigrated or removed from the record in China post-cultural revolution, like I mentioned. This especially applied to anything that was touched by the Gang of Four and Jiang Qing's personal pet projects in stage production especially. It's almost as if there was nothing entertaining about the works and critics who were actually touring China at the time of the Cultural Revolution and saw the productions had comments like this author who said, quote, I have never seen in China an audience as totally engrossed as this one. They did not applaud much, but it seemed as if they thought they shouldn't interrupt. They stared fixedly at the screen with faces completely wrapped. Each new scene creased their brows, wiped them smooth, furrowed them again more deeply, all in unison. Heads stretched forwards so that not a single detail would escape their eyes. This kind of paints the audience as, I guess, a group of brainwashed communists. I think it's really unfair to think of them like this or to think of the art that was produced as being nothing of artistic merit. It's not as if the people would just accept anything that was thrown at them, because as we saw in previous episodes, people did question the whole Cultural Revolution movement, the horrors and everything that happened. There was a lot of awareness and political consciousness that developed among the masses during this period. People were even more questioning and less idealistic than they had been before, despite the increase in the amount of propaganda being produced. So although we can't ask them, I don't think it's fair to say that the audience would have just been accepting of political propaganda and that there was nothing that they could have been enjoying outside of the propaganda. Like, I think there must have been some beauty in the performances. And actually, I've, I watched a little bit of a few of them I've, and I've seen the film The White Haired Girl. And... You know, the stories are actually interesting, as typified as they are. It's not like there's nothing entertaining about them. It's not like the people in them aren't good actors or don't sing well or the writing isn't very good. The writers are still the same talented people who would have been writing regardless of whether or not a communist regime had been taking over the country. If you think about it, if you watch the same thing over and over again you start to notice things about it that you've missed the first time. We all have a favourite film or a favourite TV show, a favourite song, a favourite book that we've consumed many, many times over. And that's because there's something intrinsically beautiful about it. Cultural production during the Cultural Revolution, like art from any era, was unique, flawed, and filled with a range of emotions. Artists themselves had to balance their own feelings with the political requirements that were rained down on them from above, which led to the production of timeless art pieces that are still being discussed and analysed till today, regardless of whether or not you think they're good. Even if it's not your taste aesthetically, or even politically, it still has merit as a representation of a particular time, a particular culture, and a particular ideology. One that was all-encompassing, but no less valid for being so. And that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget that this podcast also has a newsletter. You can subscribe by going to the Sinobabble website and filling in your details or going over to Substack and searching for Sinobabble. You can also donate to support the podcast by going to Sinobabble.com and clicking on the donate button. You can make a one-off or monthly contribution. Any amount at all is very much appreciated. Just to let you know as well, I am thinking of starting a Patreon. I'm not entirely sure what I will include in the Patreon. I'm thinking that I might release the full transcripts for the episodes as well as details of what sources I use, if that's of interest to anyone. 
But if you think that there's something else of value that I could do in the Patreon, for example, discussions of political events or historical people or current news in China, something like that, you can let me know and I will consider adding those to my Patreon. So do feel free to email me info at sinobabble.com if you've got any suggestions. And finally, you can leave a review of the podcast. That would be really, really nice if you're on Spotify or Apple Music or something like that. And if you have Twitter, you can follow me there at Sinobabble. That's it from me. Thanks so much for listening. And I hope you tune in to the next episode. Next episode. Next episode. Next episode.